Republicans did it. They held hearings about the supposed Biden crimes that completely backfired on them and only reinforced our existing belief that Joe Biden has committed no crimes, certainly no crimes that Republicans can identify. You have to see the video I have for you today, and we're really going to use this to get to what hopefully will be the end game of this endless circle of Biden crimes so we can move on to something more substantive. And by we, I mean, the Republican Party is the Republican Party going to be willing to say, all right, listen, it didn't work. Biden didn't commit any crimes, at least not that we can identify. And it is time to move on. Let's start with the first clip. Uh, Re Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was questioning Tony Bobolinsky. Now, if you recognize the name Tony Bobolinsky, it may be because he was touted on Fox News and elsewhere about a year ago, maybe eight months, maybe 14 months, something like that. He was touted by so many in the right wing media and Republicans in the House and Senate as the bombshell blockbuster witness to Biden's endless crimes. Well, he was given an opportunity to enumerate exactly those crimes, and he was unable to. Now, I do also want to be upfront with you and tell you that the clip I'm about to play for you, which I see as the total collapse of Bobolinsky, this should be the end of Bobolinsky as any relevant witness to this entire thing. I see this as a disaster for Bobolinsky. This very same clip, and this is all about, you know, the eye of the beholder. This very same clip is being circulated in right wing media circles as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez collapsing and Tony Bobolinsky proving what a great witness he is to the endless criminality of Joe Biden. I invite you go into it with an open mind and let's see what we make of it. Here we go. I have a quick question. Simple. Is it your testimony today that you personally witnessed President Joe Biden commit a crime? I believe the fact that he was sitting with me while I was putting together. A Did you deal, witness the president commit it, it, a crime? Is it your testimony today? Yes. And what crime? Do you uh, have you witnessed? How much time do I have to go through it? It is simple. You name the crime. Uh, Did you watch him steal something? Cor corruption statutes, it, RICO and conspiracy. What is it? What is Farah. what is the crime, sir? You, you specifically. You, just, uh, you keep up. You asked me to answer the question. I answered the question. No. RICO, you're obviously not familiar with corruption. Excuse statutes. me, sir. Excuse Farah. me, sir. Excuse me, sir. RICO is not a crime. It is a category. What oh, is no. the, it's the category crime? of crimes that you're then charged? You under have charges. A long hundred. You have charges, yeah. sir. Please you want me to name, name the exact statute sir? under RICO. Yes. Oh, well, it's funny in this committee room. Everyone's not here. There's over eight. All right, sir. I reclaim my time. Lawyers that I went to law school. I reclaim my time. I I'll reclaim my time. You guys, okay, thank you, sir. I reclaim my time. RICO. Clearly, what we are seeing here today is a continuation of the 15 month saga of the Republican majority lost in the desert. Impeachment 101, the majority party or whomever is raising impeachment must accuse the president of a high crime, a specific high crime or misdemeanor. I would like to submit to the record HRES 918, the House resolution to open this impeachment inquiry. Without objection to order. This resolution does not outline a high crime or misdemeanor. It now let's go through this in pieces. Who's right? Is it Tony Bobolinsky or is it AOC who are right that RICO is a category and not a crime? AOC is correct. In fact, I recently got a very extensive primer on RICO uh, reading Selwyn Rab's book, Five Families, about the origins or oranges of the Sicilian mafia in the United States and RICO as a category that was created and used in order to try to actually get some of the mob bosses who were very often were not directly involved physically in the crimes, but were overseeing them. But RICO is a category and it stands for Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. It is not a crime in itself. It was a law enacted in 1970 for organized crime. 
Uh, Trump actually may have violated uh, some laws under RICO statutes and the, the RICO framework, but there are you have to find the underlying crime. So under RICO, you can be charged with bribery. You can be charged with counterfeiting, gambling offenses, kidnapping, murder, uh, robbery, trafficking, embezzlement, uh, uh, all of these different actual crimes. And so AOC is correct. And when Tony Bobolinsky, he sat there for the crimes, he witnessed the crimes. He's sure there were crimes. What crimes? I don't know. Rico AOC is completely correct. Now, Bobolinsky also tries to do this thing where he makes AOC tries to make AOC look unreasonable by saying, what, you want me to name a statute with the number? No, AOC is not asking him to say, well, under U.S. law 54 subsection 1804. She, she's just saying, what's the crime? Is it bribery? Tell me who did he bribe? Who bribed him? Is it extortion? What was the what was the extortion? Give me the details of it. Did he traffic drugs? Did he obstruct justice? Did he launder money or commit securities fraud? All things which could be charged under the RICO framework. And Bobolinsky can't do it because he doesn't know because there isn't actually evidence of a crime. This isn't the first time that this happened. Remember this viral video? We looked at this. Uh, what was this four or five months ago? December. This is Democratic Congressman Joe Neguse doing a very good job of asking Republican Congressman Guy Reschenthaler, what is the crime? And it actually was even worse. Remember this to the core. I think the question I'm asking Where, you is, you, okay, go ahead, what, what, what is the specific constitutional crime that you're investigating? Well, we're having an inquiry so we can do an investigation and control okay. the production of witnesses. And, and what is the and, crime and, you're investigating? And documents, high crimes, misdemeanors and bribery. What high crime and misdemeanor are you investigating? Look, I, I will once I get time, I will explain what we're looking at and I will make the equivalency. No, I'm just of asking you the for last the, impeachment. I, OK, so I, what I'm trying to say, Mr. Reschenthaler, and again, I say this because I served as a prosecutor during the last impeachment of former President Trump. There was a specific high crime that he was impeached for on a bipartisan basis. Thirteen Republicans agreed during 2019 when President Trump was impeached. There were two very specific offenses that he was impeached for. And I can't get an answer. I don't think members of the Oversight Committee could get an answer uh, or the Ways and Means Committee or the Judiciary Committee. I don't think there is an answer. I, there's not. And of course, it's unsurprising because according to even Fox News correspondents, House Republicans have been unable to make any kind of connection to a, a constitutional high crime and misdemeanor and President Biden. So I, I don't I, I would say this to make the argument that there is some similarity between and I, I don't know if this is what you're. All right. So you get it again. Guy Reschenthaler also can't identify a crime at a certain point, folks. If it looks like a duck and it talks like a duck and it sounds like a duck and it smells like a duck and it reproduces like a duck and it eats like a duck, maybe it's a duck. And here the duck is in the absence of any evidence of any single crime, even potentially committed by Joe Biden. Maybe it's because Joe Biden didn't commit any crimes. Now, if you thought this looked bad for Republicans. Just wait until I show you the next thing. Remember Lev Parnas? I interviewed Lev Parnas a couple weeks ago. Lev was Trump's henchman in Ukraine. Lev is the guy that was sent over to do the quid pro quo. Lev told us everything. And members of the House also wanted to hear from Lev. And yesterday, Lev Parnas testified before the House committee and he made an incredible assertion that should be front page news everywhere. But you're not hearing about it on Fox News. That's for damn sure. Lev Parnas indicated we had Ron Johnson in the Senate. Now, let me explain this to you. What Lev Parnas alleges in the clip we're about to watch is that they were counting on. They knew that whatever sort of uh, uh, propaganda about Ukraine and Biden and whatever they could generate was going to be repeated by Ron Johnson in the Senate. That was their guy. Here's Congressman Maxwell Frost, a Democrat, asking questions of Lev Parnas. And here is Lev Parnas explaining the whole thing. This, this is just unbelievable stuff. Or is it or is it actually perfectly believable based on what we've seen? over the last eight years. Authors of the Republican Burisma report would be your quote guy in the Senate to push all the information, end quote. What, what did you mean by that? 
Uh, Senator Ron Johnson was our guy in the Senate. He was told to me that uh, when we push the information, he's going to push it in the halls of Congress. So when the media was getting skeptical about pushing disinformation after they've proven it wrong time and time again, right. the, the, the plan was to have a U.S. senator, Ron Johnson, to push that disinformation even further. Correct, because we had Congressman Nunez already doing it, so Senator Ron Johnson jumped on board. This Congress, both Chairman Comer and Chairman Jordan, have centered this entire sham impeachment hearing on an uh, FBI tip sheet. This tip sheet made wild claims about bribery that didn't even come close to being backed up. Um, and in fact, it's all being proved to be one big lie. Mr. Parnas, is the allegation um, in the FBI tip sheet based on the same fabricated claims that Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani flew, flew you to Ukraine to dig up? Yes. I also want to make it clear that the informant allegedly behind this tip sheet is facing criminal charges for lying about the Biden family and was a known fraud for years before that. So listen, Republicans in these grand hearings that were going to show just how criminal of a person Joe Biden is had one of their main witnesses testifying from prison. <laughs> uh, they had testimony completely backfire as they continue to be unable to identify a single actual crime that Joe Biden even may be committed. It's not even, oh, we don't have the proof. They don't even have a crime that they are able to cogently list. And then, by the way, Lev Parnas testifies that they had a Republican senator they could count on to spread Russian disinformation. This, by the way, is why Lev Parnas was not allowed to testify in that first impeachment hearing of Donald Trump. Think of how damaging this testimony would have been there. And so as Luke Beasley tweeted or put out on X, he put out an excretion on X. Luke said, you know, a sitting U.S. senator pushing Russian disinformation should be a bigger story than what shoes President Biden is wearing. And yet what Luke is referring to is that yesterday after this hearing, you could turn on Fox News and see them talking about how in order to help Biden not fall down, he's been wearing sneakers sometimes. Wow. What hard hitting journalism, as Lev Parnas says, we were counting on Ron Johnson to spread Russian disinformation for us. This entire thing has collapsed. These are not serious people and they are people who should pack up their stuff and never be involved in government again. Unfortunately, there are tens of millions of Republicans around the country who love these folks. They want to elect them again. Ron Johnson, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, you, you name them. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions or tens of millions in some cases of people who say this is what I want representing me in Congress, in the Senate, in civil civil government. Uh, so as Jamie Raskin has now numerous times declared, this is the end of the entire impeachment thing, right? Right? Well, it should be, but it doesn't appear to be. They seem determined to continue after the break. I will show you how all of this was wrapped up in a pathetic little box with a bow uh, on Fox News. It probably won't shock you. Quick break right back after this. Don't forget that the best way to support the David Pakman show is by becoming a member, which gives you access to the daily bonus show, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire archive of every episode dating back a really long time and plenty of other awesome membership perks. Go to joinpacman.com. Joinpacman.com. The David Pakman Show is an audience supported program. If you like what we do, get the full experience without commercials with the daily bonus show by signing up at joinpacman.com. You know, I continue to get emails from folks who say, David, I love what you do. It's too bad that you don't have the support of some of those mainstream and corporate media programs. It is too bad. But it's not some vague thing we can do nothing about. You can support us. You can sign up at joinpacman.com. We include a bunch of great perks and extras for our members. And you can use the coupon code Save Democracy 24 to get a discount off of the cost of a membership. On today's bonus show, so many interesting stories, including a North Dakota ballot question that could really test whether it would be legal to have an age limit for elected officials and much more all on today's bonus show. Well, Republicans have finally found it. They've got the proof. Joe Biden has a bank account and sometimes he deposits checks into the bank account. 
Now, you might be saying, David, is that a crime? And of course it's not. But that's really all they've been able to prove so far. Uh, Maria Bartiromo on Fox News, bless her heart. She continues to ask people like Jim Jordan and others. What exactly do you have proof of when it comes to what Joe Biden has done? And in the aftermath of yesterday's disastrous hearings on Capitol Hill, she asked Jim Jordan, how much money have you identified that went directly to Joe Biden? They start the segment with a screenshot of a, a, a sort of a, a scan of a check written to Joe Biden um, on the screen. And again, remember, they say this is their evidence. We've got the checks. We've got the bank records, the movement of money. All this proves is James Biden gave Joe Biden some money reportedly to pay a uh, repay loan that Biden gave his brother. That's all this proves. And they seem to have determined that, yes, indeed, Joe Biden has a bank account. But look at how vapid Jim Jordan's explanation is how much money have you been able to identify that has gone directly to Joe Biden? Because I know your colleagues, uh, James Comer, the chairman of oversight, has told me that you, you've identified 30 million dollars from foreign characters <laughs> all over the world. Yeah. Hilariously, Joe Biden's reportedly worth between eight and 10 million. But just in bribes, he's received 30 million. Pretty compelling stuff, right? That have sent money to the Biden clan. And I'm trying to understand how much Joe Biden actually got of that, if in right. fact he got any of it. Well, th there's there's the, the loan payments, there's the 200,000, there's the four, uh, $40,000 that, that we we can show. They say it's a loan payment, even though there's no documents for it. This this is all stuff that the oversight committee has uncovered. Uh, I mean, th this is part of the, the, whole, the whole strategy here, moving money around all these different companies. Right. And of course, I mean, I, I, I at a certain point, we just have to say, hey, you guys are morons. You guys really are morons. I know it's not politically correct and we have to be polite and say, oh, well, we don't we're concerned that there might be a lack of credible. These at some point are moronic imbeciles. There's no other way to say it. They say 30 million dollars is moving around here and Biden's getting tens of millions. And what have they identified? They've identified that Biden gave his brother two hundred thousand. And then they've identified that his brother gave him back 40,000. And they say, you know, they claim it's for a loan, but there's no record and there's no contract for that loan. It may be a bad idea. You know, they say don't do business with friends and family. It may be a bad idea, but it's really common that when family members loan each other money, they don't necessarily write up a loan contract. It's n if you talk to lawyers, they will say this can get sticky. You probably should have something in writing just so if if it becomes a problem, you can say, hey, look, here's what we agreed to. OK, here are the terms. But so many family members don't do that. And all they have, supposedly there's dozens of crimes and tens of millions of dollars. All they have is a couple hundred thousand bucks moving between Biden and family members. And the red flag, the smoking gun is that if it's a loan, they didn't put together a loan document within their family. They have nothing. They have nothing. Again, this is all damage control because yesterday went so terribly in these House hearings meant to show and prove all of the crimes Biden committed. Here's another one. Here's Republican Congressman Jason Smith on Fox News saying we actually can't name a single thing that Biden supposedly did for foreign governments in exchange for the money. Listen to this Kazakhstanis or uh, if it is the Kazakhstanis, <laughs> apologize, or the Ukrainians. What did they get for the services that were provided? I think every situation is different. And a lot of it in regards to the Chinese, we don't know the answers to. But Jim Jordan <laughs> has been very specific about right. Ukraine. And when you talk about Burisma, you have President Biden, when he was vice president, said that they were going to withhold over a billion dollars unless this prosecutor that was investi investigating Burisma, which is a company that Hunter Biden paid millions of dollars. So for So as you can see. He's just going into the debunked Burisma talking points. The question from Bill Hemmer was a very reasonable question. What exactly did Biden do and for who? Because there's two sides to this, right? There's Biden got money to create favorable policy for foreign governments or foreign companies. First of all, 
a lot of these allegations center around a time at which Joe Biden was neither the vice president nor the president. So the timing doesn't even pass the sniff test to a great degree. Then you have the money side of it, which is Biden was given money by these foreign governments and companies. Do they have proof of that? No. Whenever we ask, they say, well, we need more bank records. We need more stuff. But we do see a couple hundred thousand bucks moving between Joe and uh, Joe and Jim Biden. OK, so on the money side, they have no proof. But then there's the other side. There's the money he supposedly got, which they can't prove was in exchange for what? What what policy did Biden change? They also have no answers to that. Jason Smith reverting to, well, Hunter Biden and Burisma, that stuff's all long been debunked. So they don't really have anything. And maybe the most honest guy right now, this is crazy. Maybe the most honest guy is Newsmax host Rob Finnerty, who said to Jim Jordan, you kind of seem to be chasing your tail. It really doesn't seem like this is going anywhere. And I have to tell you, folks, Rob Finnerty is correct. But uh, uh, Jim Jordan doesn't want to hear it. Uh, is impeachment the next step? Are you going to hold a vote on the House floor? I know it's up to Mike Johnson, but the margins, Congressman, you lost Kevin McCarthy. Ken Buck left last week. George Santos was ousted. Unless you get Democratic votes, this is going to be real tough. So it, it kind of seems like you're chasing your tail at this point because this is not going to well, go anywhere. Now, Rob Finnerty is saying it's because you don't have Democrats willing to support you. It won't go anywhere. Of course, the reality is there's no evidence. That's why it won't go anywhere. But the question is still a good one. It's not going anywhere. No, fair question. And we got a, you know, we got a small majority. Everyone understands that, not just on this issue, but on a host of issues. Our job is under the Constitution is to do oversight of the executive branch. We are doing that. We're going to continue to do that. There's no time limit in the Constitution on how long you can do an event. And that's probably the key. There's no time limit. It's not going anywhere. We're not going to impeach because we don't have any evidence. There's going to be no prosecution because there is no evidence. There won't be criminal referrals because we have no crime. But there's no time limit. We can just keep on doing this for as long as we think it'll be advantageous to us. And at certainly that means up to and through the election, I would assume. So Rob Finnerty, He's uh, he's taking a strange path to the right conclusion. This is going absolutely nowhere. Yet another psychiatrist says that the evidence of Trump's dementia is, quote, overwhelming. Remember, we spoke to Dr. John Gartner a few weeks ago who says there is a neurological smoking gun here. And now we have yet another medical expert who says the same thing. This is from Newsweek. There is, quote, overwhelming evidence that Donald Trump is suffering from dementia. A leading psychiatrist claims Dr. Lance Dodes, a supervising analyst emeritus of the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute and retired Harvard Medical School professor, was among those recently quoted by duty to warn with duty to warn, quote, unlike normal aging characterized by forgetting names or words. Trump repeatedly shows something very different. Confusion about reality. And this reference is Trump confusing Obama with Joe Biden. And he goes on. If he were to become president, he would have to immediately be removed from office via the 25th Amendment as dangerously unable to fulfill the responsibilities of office, writes Dodes, who's also a distinguished fellow of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. In another statement put out at the same time, New York psychologist Suzanne Lachman said Trump would, quote, seemingly forget how the sentence began and invent something in the middle, resulting in an incomprehensible word salad frequently seen in patients who have dementia. The article also quotes John Gartner, again, who I spoke to a few weeks ago, uh, who says that uh, Trump is showing, quote, unmistakable signs strongly suggesting dementia. Jason Miller senior advisor to the Trump campaign, says it is Biden who's having the problem, saying Joe Biden is clearly suffering from cognitive decline and couldn't answer the first five questions of a cognitive test or any test for that matter. You know, uh, I am not going to weigh in beyond telling you what it is that the medical experts are seeing because they are the medical experts and I am not. But one of the things that I would be bracing for is the narcissistic collapse, for lack of a better term, that is imminent if and when it is determined Trump just can't afford the bond. He just can't afford it. He's not going to be able to pay the bond that he may have to mortgage his properties for or they might be seized. It truly seems as though the guy is on the brink of snapping 
And one of the things we've been observing casually, colloquially as non medical experts is that the decline seems to be happening more and more and more quickly. The frequency, it used to be once a rally and then twice a rally. And then all of a sudden, eight, 10, 12 times a rally, Trump disoriented, saying Biden beat Obama or Nikki Haley was responsible for security on January 6th. If Monday pans out the way that it might, either with the final determination that Trump can't make bond, possibly with Letitia James starting to seize Trump's properties, I assume that the decline is going to be even faster. And he has months of campaigning to do on top of all this. How is this even remotely viable? How is this even possibly going to work? I don't know. But when you ask the Magapotamians about it, the Magadonians, uh, they say everything's fine and Biden doesn't know what day it is. You make of it what you will. Alina Haba, Trump's on again, off again lawyer, refused to deny that in a desperate moment, Trump wouldn't go to Saudi Arabia or to Russia for the money he needs to secure the bond in the civil fraud trial with a deadline, at least of now for now of Monday. Here is Alina Haba. What role does she now have with Trump? She used to be his lawyer. Is she a legal spokesperson? Is she legally representing him anywhere? Is she merely a TV lawyer at this point? God, I don't know. But here is Martha McCallum on Fox News saying, is Trump looking at Saudi Arabia or Russia to get the money he needs? And Alina Haba, rather than saying no, she says, well, I can't speak to strategy right now. Um, is there any effort on the part of your team to secure this money through another country, Saudi Arabia or Russia, as Joy Behar seems to think? Well, there's rules and regulations that are public. I can't speak about strategy that require certain things, and we have to follow those rules. Like I said, <laughs> this is manifest injustice. It is impossible. It's an impossibility. I believe they knew that. I think that's why mid-trial, frankly, they changed their ask from 250 million mm -hmm. to the ridiculous amount of money that they've asked for. I think everything is done intentionally. I do not doubt that the witch hunt, that the election interference goal is what was uh, if you're waiting for a no, you're not going to find it in this answer. Ringing steady and loudly and true throughout all these trials, frankly, and we're seeing it. It's the demise of our country, not the demise of Trump. So we'll, we'll handle it as we always have and, and keep our heads up and keep right. working hard. There you go. Trump potentially going to the Saudis or the Russians for money to pay the bond after defrauding the state of New York uh, endlessly. That doesn't say anything about Trump, according to Haba. That says more about the demise of the country. Now, the answer that in a normal world we would hear is, of course, Trump is not going to Saudi Arabia or Russia to get the money he needs to make this bond and to keep the appeal going. But we didn't hear that. We heard something very, very different. Here's one more clip in which Alina Haba seems to think or see Trump as some kind of uh, gift, God's gift to architecture and the New York skyline, acting like he is some kind of genius for what he did to the New York skyline. Tell me a little bit about where you are in this process, because it, it, in terms of the appeals happening or the appeals court deciding, the appellate division deciding that perhaps they're going to make some modifications to this judgment. Right. Well, our argument in front of the appellate division is that forcing him to sell prized properties such as Trump Tower, iconic properties like 40 Wall Street, to pursue his appeal is manifest injustice. And it deprives him of that due process that we are all entitled to. So imagine you can't reverse selling off Trump right. Tower on a fire sale at a discounted price. We can't fix that if we win on an appeal. So it's complete injustice. And only a handful of sureties, as we stated, are approved by the United States Department of Treasury to even underwrite bonds of this size. So of those, even those very limited handful of amounts, they're limited to policies with even single bonds up to maybe 100 million. None of them accept hard assets. They require cash or cash, cash equivalents such as. And why do you think that's the case, Alina? Marketable securities. The ask of Judge Ingoran is 
completely ridiculous. He knew that, or if he didn't know that, then he should have educated himself on it. But it is intentionally to interfere in the election, to hurt President Trump, to try and ruin his company and ruin a person and a family whose private company, not public company, has made the skyline of New York changed forever and made so many jobs, created jobs. There you go. It's just iconic what Trump was able to do to the New York skyline. By the way, some of the buildings she's talking about, like 40 Wall Street, Trump didn't build those buildings, right? Trump is the landlord at this point, but he didn't build those buildings. Um, listen, this is uh, very quickly going to get very ugly. And of course, it's all woe is me. It's all so unfair. Trump's perfect. He's been treated so unfairly. But the bottom line here is that he simply doesn't have the cash. All of this stuff about there aren't that many companies that are authorized to provide bonds of this size. If Trump simply had the money, if he's really worth six billion and all of the stuff he claims, if he really had the money, if he wasn't already over leveraged on his properties to begin with, he wouldn't need to go and seek a bond in this way. He would simply have the money. He doesn't. And that's what's at the core here. If you value what we do at The David Pakman Show, remember to support us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash David Pakman Show, where you can get access to behind the scenes videos, the daily bonus show the commercial free daily show. You can support the show for as little as two dollars a month. Check it out at patreon.com slash David Pakman show. Today we're going to be speaking with Austin Frerich, who's an antitrust and agriculture expert at Yale University and also author of the book Barons, Money, Power and the Corruption of America's Food. Uh, this is a super interesting topic, and it, I, I think there's lots of people in my audience, Austin, who have a sense of this, at least as related to a particular industry or maybe generally when it comes to the advent of ultra processed food and how it allows the extraction of more profit from a crop like, for example, corn, where if it's just corn, you very quickly get to the limit of what you can make from corn. You can either grow it more densely or charge more. But an ear of corn is an ear of corn. So you separate it into 40 different products included. So I think people have a sense of that. But in the book, by looking at some of the big agriculture barons, you look at maybe some particular food industries that are less familiar to people. So I'll let you pick where we start. Is there a particular barren and industry that yeah. you think is the least known? The story behind it is the least known to the average food consumer, which is all of us. My favorite little one that, that shocks people the most is Driscoll's. Um, they're my berry barren in the book. So they sell one in three berries, but they don't actually grow a single berry. Uh, they contract out production. And this model of agricultural production goes back to sharecropping. It was first used in chicken, then went to pork, and then Driscoll's applied it to berry production. That's interesting. So let's talk that one through. My my baby daughter loves berries. And so no matter where we go, you know, we, we landed in California for a wedding and I have to stop and make sure I've got blueberries, blackberries and raspberries. And it's the exact same Driscoll's brand that we get in New York. And so I'm wondering, oh, are these grown in one place and shipped everywhere? Or how does it work? It's actually just a name. And these are berries that could be grown in all sorts of different places. They are subcontracted in a sense. Is that the way it works? Exactly. So um, in my book, Walmart's like the, the King Baron and Driscoll's was really smart, but it realized the coming of Walmart. So it realized you need to do four berries year round for 4000 stores. So the production regions change around the world. So Driscoll's actually grows berries in every single continent in the world, except Antarctica. Hmm. And part of each Baron is I'm. it's not just lifestyles of the rich and famous. I wanted to t tell these bigger structural stories with each Baron. So for me, Driscoll's is really about not only farm labor, the exploitations because of this production model, but also the offshoring of the produce system in America, where anything that's labor intensive has basically moved offshore. I had a crazy situation when I was recently in Aruba where, you know, one of the great things about Aruba is for Americans, the grocery stores are what we would call fantastic. You go to the grocery store. I can get the same oranges I'm used to getting. I can get all the same stuff. It's comfortable. It's great. You know, you can pack your lunch at the beach and all this stuff. And quite literally, a bunch of the produce that is available in Aruba comes from the United States, or at least it's branded with the same brands as what we see in the United States. And I had this conversation 
with a customs agent because they have preclearance there where you like go through American customs in Aruba with some of my daughter's food. And we had like a cut of banana and orange and different things. And he said, oh, no, you can't bring that stuff to the United States. You can't you, you can't bring it. And I said, what's so funny is it came to Aruba from the United States. At least some of these products did. And th is talk a little bit about that globalization of a lot of the produce and food that we now have. Yeah. I mean, let me start with the notion, and we saw this in COVID, is these supply chains, these really long ones, first of all, they're bad for the climate, um, but also they're incredibly fragile. So we used to have used to have much more regional production supply chain, especially for produce. And as these things get global, or you know, there's certain times of year most of your berries you're eating are coming from Argentina. Um, th when they break, they break and they break hard. I mean, that to me is like why you see this big pivot under the Biden administration to more localize these supply chains. Um, for food production, I mean, I love how you say the grocery store because when my husband and I travel, that's one of the first things I do is I love going to grocery stores just to kind of see what else is out there. But it also kind of sterilizes the grocery store in a little bit. Like, yeah, the thing that blew my mind was I went to Thailand after I graduated college and there's so much more fruit out there than we realize. And that to me was like one of the funnest things of like buying random things. I had no clue what they were, but just trying it. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, you said the way in which the actual harvesting uh, takes advantage of workers and labor isn't particularly good to workers. I think many of us have seen videos where the conditions often are you're in direct sun for hour after hour, sometimes in uncomfortable pos positions, not always with ready access to bathrooms and hand washing. But there, there is there more to it than just that when we talk about the way that the food industry deals with labor? It's even worse. I would compare it to almost like a modern day plantation system. Hmm. So like for dairy production, a lot of it's shifted to Baja, California, to a region that gets as much rain as Death Valley, three inches a year. Um, so the first, the, this area was the aquifers were drained for berry production. And then Driscoll's built a desalinization plant in the ocean for it. This area was sparsely populated for indigenous workers were then brought in. These are very kind of you rarely see stories come out of these labor stories, but when they do, they're nasty. First of all, it's really hard to report on this. This is dangerous. There has been reporting in Reuters how Mexican gains have like gotten into avocado production. But, uh, you know, the LA Times did a great series called Made in Mexico, like maybe five, 10 years ago at this point, but they're reporting how you have 12 year olds working in these berry patches. And so honestly, to me, it reminds me of like the apparel industry. When that stuff moved to Southeast Asia, it almost became a norm for the industry to have these massive disasters every few years. And hmm. you get kind of numb to it. That, that to me is like the big concern here. And then also, I should also note, it undermines people doing it right here. So all the progress, you know, farm worker unions made in America and California is undermined by this production model because they're not playing on a fair field. When it comes to uh, you, know, I, I think that oftentimes there are those who focus on an animal rights perspective when it comes to food. And so you hear a lot about meat and you hear a lot about dairy. You hear about conditions, environmental impact, et cetera. And I think that's completely legitimate. I think it's less of a well-known story, for example, the amount of water that avocados and almonds require and then the number of salamanders and frogs and small animals whose habitats are destroyed by the amount of water that is required for some of these other crops. Is there a cut and dry list of foods where you can say these are completely morally fine, however you slice and dice it? Or are these all pretty complicated at this point? Um, two things. One, I just think what we eat should depend, differ where we are in the country. You know, you're going to eat more fish in New England than you know, pork in Iowa. We need to re bring back that regionalization of the food system, kind of like what you see in Europe, where it's a little, it's both beautiful and kind of scary that upper, you know, northern Maine, I can get the same food as, you know, Palm Springs. Um, that said, me and dairy is really dark. I mean, besides animal stuff, um, to me, I think it actually contributed to a lot of this. It's contributing to this right wingism, extremism you see in American politics. Like, take Iowa, like where I'm from. You had the death of the hog family farm in my lifetime. My hog baron does 5 million hogs a year. Um, what used to be family farms are now low-wage workers carrying out dead pig bodies in the, these facilities. Um, I view Iowa as almost an extraction colony and like the canary in the coal mine of what could happen if we don't deal with these very greedy men. I mean, that is, my coffee baron's really about that. Is There's a, this kind of this forgotten history in monopoly stuff where 
it's monopolists who usually finance fascists. And we saw the, the most extreme case is Hitler. His largest donor was IG Farb in a chemical monopoly. And so I, I kind of tell that story in that chapter. Um, that to me is like the really dark undercurrent to this is especially the meat and dairy production. Cause it's also, these are living animals and it's not done well. I mean, the, the, there's so much labor environmental, you name it. It's a, it's an issue in that field. So how can the average person, I mean, I don't even know how to formulate this question, right? Cause it's like, yeah. okay, so the, the berries are a problem. The coffee is a problem. Meat and dairy are a problem. Avocados are a problem. I would argue soy is a problem in regard to the kind of monoculture impact it has on the land over which it's grown is I know I guess we can kind of rank the degree to which these these foods are problematic. And I'm guessing that there are some where the environmental concern is lower, but the labor rights concern is higher, for example, or the shipping footprint or, or whatever. Does just buy local kind of solve all of it? And is that even really feasible or like what what does the average consumer do here? It's both. So just step back. A big point of my goal in my book was I really want to spend a lot of time at the end of where do we go from here? Because I think right now in this moment, politically in America, people want hope. Like there is no positive vision, especially for rural America. And so the what you could you can critique the system, but where do we go from here? Post neoliberalism. Right. And I think people actually find that inspiring. And like for me, especially in the food production system, ethanol is going to collapse. I think that's one of the best things to happen. And the electric vehicles is going to do that. Put animals back on the land. That is such a good way to take the temperature down in the Midwest in these areas. It makes better food. It's a jobs program. You name it. What you know, that? But from like a structural thing is both at the local level, what you can do individually is help your local farmer get, first of all, there are a lot of people doing it right. Like that is, don't, it's just, you have a few greedy men holding us back. Get local procurement contracts at your school, at your college for the people doing it right. Right? Because any farmer will tell you, they don't really like doing the farmer's market. They get rained out. It's not consistent income. That contract with the college for carrots every week, that stabilizes their business. It rewards mm. good people doing the right thing. At the same time too, we got to do bigger structural things. I'm at the point now of just junking the farm bill. It's designed to overproduce grains at the at the expense of everything else. Because there's like, to me, the, the core thing here is everything you eat is subsidized. There is no free market in the food system. The question is to what degree. And right now we are subsidizing highly processed foods at the expense of produce. So that to me is like, you got to do both high and low at the same time. Can you go back and explain what you mean by Electric vehicles will cause ethanol to collapse, and then that will be a good thing. I, explain that, because I don't know that that's. I, I'm not even sure I know what you mean. So, um, the Biden administration's being really aggressive about transitioning the American car fleet to um, electric vehicles, hybrids, what have you. Yep. Um, at the same time, this, the single largest use of corn out in America is ethanol. Mm. No one is talking about. That transition to the car is going to happen pretty fast. That, therefore, that ethanol market will collapse. And so what are you going to do with half the corn acreage that you don't need anymore? I mean, the industry starting to freak out. They're trying to put ethanol in planes, but it's just a farce. I mean, the conversation over ethanol is done. It's over. Um, and so that to me is the hope is this land's going to be idle soon. How do we how do we get rid of this industrial model of animals and then basically go back to what we used to did and put the animals back on the land? And the idea is that the electric vehicles may accelerate that by forcing those who own those ethanol fields to figure out what else are we going to do with them? Bingo. Because that is, I mean, because the system right now push people into ethanol because there's so much subsidies in it that if you do the right kind of thing, oh, people be like, oh, it's economical to put animals back on my land now. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. The book is Barons, Money, Power and the Corruption of America's Food. There is the book. We've been speaking with the book's author, Austin Frerich. Really, uh, really appreciate it. The book is super interesting and I appreciate you being on today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, David. Follow us on social media, interact with the David Pakman Show community, see exclusive content, see when we're taking calls live and stay up to date on other big show announcements. We post daily. Find us on Reddit, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord and TikTok. 
There are signs of trouble in one particular number out of Florida for what's forthcoming in November for the failed former president, Donald Trump. And it is the fact that Donald Trump didn't even match his 2020 numbers in the Florida Republican primary. Now, I know many people will say, but sir, this year it was a contested primary in 2020. It was an uncontested primary. Was it really contested this year? Because everybody dropped out weeks ago. So let me kind of tee it up for you. We spoke yesterday about Nikki Haley getting more than 150,000 votes in the Florida Republican primary despite the fact that she ended her campaign weeks ago. And in total, about 200,000 of the people that voted in the Republican primary in Florida went out, despite the fact that Trump was running unopposed and voted for someone other than Trump, about 150,000 for Nikki Haley. I think it was like 30, 40,000 for Ron DeSantis, about 10, 15,000 for various other candidates. And that shows at least to some degree uh, a motivation, a significant motivation, we can say, for some Florida Republicans to show I don't approve of Donald Trump as the nominee. The Washington Post has an interesting article which points out that despite Donald Trump catch, capturing an overwhelming percentage of the Florida Republican vote, he didn't even match his own numbers from 2020. And in fact, that's true. On Tuesday night in Florida, Trump received 81 percent of the Republican primary vote. But in 2020, he had received 93 percent of the vote. Now, again, you can make the case it's not a fair comparison because in 2020, officially, there was no primary. And in 2024, there was a primary, but everybody dropped out. And so it's kind of contested, kind of not. And it, and it makes sense. That's all fine. But the point that should not be ignored and Trump ignores it at his peril when he says, I don't really think I need Nikki Haley supporters to support me. Well, we'll see, especially because many of them are choosing to now donate to Joe Biden instead of Donald Trump. We'll get to that in a moment. If you look at the totality of this, 200,000 Florida Republicans in an uncontested primary going out to vote for someone other than Trump, Trump not matching his 2020 support in 2024. As I mentioned, Taylor Swift getting young voters in Florida activated, presumably with the forthcoming endorsement of Joe Biden, all of these different little elements, it all could add up to significant trouble for Donald Trump in Florida. But as I mentioned yesterday, it doesn't even really matter because Joe Biden doesn't need Florida. All Joe Biden needs is to carry the states he won in 2020 and he wins with a very healthy electoral vote margin. So this is not me making any kind of prediction. It'll likely come down to under half a million votes in five to six states, as I've said before. But the point here is this is a difficult situation for Donald Trump. He lost 2020. There are signs in states he won in 2020 that don't look so good like these numbers in Florida. And yet we are supposed to believe that he's going to have an easy time defeating Joe Biden because he's leading in some of the national polls. I would be very hesitant to believe that. But regardless, it could happen. We all have to vote in every state, no matter what we expect the margin to be. But that one number not looking good for Trump. And then look at what we've now learned about Nikki Haley donors. This is incredible. There are prominent Nikki Haley donors who now in Nikki Haley's absence as she has dropped out from the Republican primary, they are not going and supporting Donald Trump, the presumptive and, and all but official Republican presidential nominee. Some of them are switching over to Joe Biden. Newsweek has an article about this and it reads donors who supported Nikki Haley in her Republican primary are set to switch their allegiance to Joe Biden. Trump was confirmed as the Republican nominee. He's going to face off against Biden. Haley dropped out of the race. Media mogul Jeffrey Katzenberg called Harry Sloan, who previously helped bring in at least five hundred and fifty thousand dollars for Haley and asked him donate to Biden instead. He has also donated to Democrats in the past and gave one hundred thousand dollars to a pro Biden pack. Sloan said he agreed to help raise money for Biden. People I know who are generally business Republicans, they're going to hear from me about helping Biden. Biden's campaign finance chair, Rufus Gifford, also told the outlet that he's in a WhatsApp group called Haley supporters for Biden, and they are seeking to recruit more Haley donors to the cause. And the point that is made here is that a bunch of different Haley donors are saying, I'm not going for Trump, I'm going for Biden. Now, I can tell you that personally, I'm seeing this as well. You know, I have a lot of uh, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts Republican friends and New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts Republicans 
are very different than people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, every single one of them. Now, obviously, th there's self-selection bias here, right? Am I really going to have friends that are lunatic, hardcore MAGAs? Those are probably not the types of folks that will end up in my circles, but just sort of like socially liberal. I like low taxes type Republicans, the sorts of folks who prefer folks like Romney, McCain, Haley over lunatics like Trump. I have some of them in my social circles and every single one said to me, I'm supporting Nikki. I voted Biden in 2020. And if it's Trump versus Biden, I'm going to be supporting Joe Biden. So anecdotally, I can tell you this is absolutely happening. Now, I do want to address one talking point that has surfaced related to this. There are some on the litmus test left who are saying, see, David, I told you so. Biden is a right winger. The reason that Haley people are switching to Biden rather than Trump is because Biden is right wing and this is the proof. And I hate to burst your bubble, but that is absolutely absolutely not the case. What this is when Nikki Haley supporters say Trump's too crazy, I've got to vote Biden. It's that they are going beyond party. They are doing what's best for the country rather than what's best for their party. They are supporting the basics of our democracy. And that is something that increasingly is only being seen from the nominees on the Democratic side. If you value upholding the basic framework and tenets of our democracy, your only viable choice in 2024 is Joe Biden. Remember, Trump said, I don't need nor want Haley voters. He may not want them, but he may well need them. And we'll figure that out in November. So it's not that Biden is so right wing that he's appealing to Haley supporters. It's that if you care about democracy, and the United States just sticking to the things we've promised we would do globally. Your only choice in 2024 is Joe Biden. And there are some Republicans who are willing to put that over party and say, I can't vote Trump. Biden's really the choice. They should be welcome. They shouldn't be shunned. They should be welcomed for saying, I disagree with so much of what Joe Biden does, but at least he supports the basics that the country is, is founded on. I say, bring them in. Let's get Joe Biden in another four years. And then we have four years to disagree on policy. That's the right way to do it. We have a voicemail number. That number is two one nine two David P. Here is a voicemail about the physical versus ebook debate. Listen to this. Hey, David, this is only from Dallas, Texas. Uh, a couple of months ago, I raised a question in terms of your opinion regarding uh, audiobooks versus uh, traditional books. Uh, but now I have a new question. Uh, do you prefer, do you think that reading physical books is better than reading, uh, you know, books on, you know, Kindle or on your iPad? Um, or do you think that there's not really much of a difference? All right. This is a very good question. There is probably a difference between reading physical books and reading ebooks. There are a bunch of studies that have come to conclusions like, for example, you absorb more from physical books. Physical books are easier on the eyes. Physical books are better for sleep and sleep hygiene. So you're not on a device in bed at night. Um, I am not super concerned with those studies, although I do think that they are interesting. But for me, it's the bigger picture of there is a physical experience of reading a paper book that you simply don't get when you go from Facebook to your Kindle app on your phone. And with so much now happening on screens, I want to preserve activities that are not taking place on screens. In fact, uh, Cal Newport, who was on the show recently, recently spoke about this when he talks about physical notebooks and the experience of writing on a physical notebook on a recent uh, podcast episode of his. So I do prefer physical books. At one point, I almost switched to ebook. And then I said, you know what? I do enough on screens. I want the experience of the physical book. There's something about, you know, on a plane, be reading the physical book in bed at night, reading the physical book. In addition to this, if you store all your books on a device, then you lose the physical library in the home and the physical library in the home is known to be tied to better educational outcomes for kids. The physical library in the home is known to generate ideas. When you look over and you see the physical library and the books that you've read, 
There's something that it does for creativity. There's something that it does psychologically. Uh, I think that that's all uh, yet another reason to stick to physical books. But one other thing I will say is that any reading is better than none. We recently talked about a study that found that half roughly half of Americans did not read a single book last year, not a single book. So if it's the difference between reading or not reading at all, go with the ebook. By all means, have at it. If I'm honest, I prefer the physical books. I think there's a lot of good reasons to go with the physical book. And speaking of physical books, let me tell you about something else that is going on. It's an election year. There are so many kids that don't understand how our elections work. They don't know why voting is so important. They don't know about the president and the Senate and the House of Representatives. It's a real problem. When we identified a crisis in critical thinking, I wrote a children's book about critical thinking. When we identified a problem in understanding the scientific method, I wrote a book about the scientific method for kids. Think like a scientist. And I now announce to you today with peace, love and humility, the launch of the third book in the Adventures in Thinking series. This is think like a voter, think like a voter. And I think that there is no better time to release such a book than an election year. This is a book that whether you're talking about a six year old, an eight year old, a 12 year old, honestly, <laughs> there's 14 year olds who don't have any idea what's going on with our election system, maybe reading with parent, guardian or teacher or maybe on your own. Uh, this is a really important time and a really important book for this particular time. So I invite you go to davidpackmancom slash book. We're showing elements of the book on the screen to people who are watching. Uh, grab the book. And uh, if you have local libraries in your area, most libraries have a process where you can ask them to get the book. It costs you nothing. Uh, often it's submit a form online. Get this book for the library and the library will go out and get it. Gift a bunch of copies to your kids class. This is not a political book. There's no political jokes in it. It is just down the line. Here's why voting matters. Here's how we vote. We have registration. There's ballot initiatives. It's the basics of what we do and what we will be doing in November and what we've been doing in the primaries. I can't think of a more important time for this. So please grab a copy. Please review the book. OK, the reviews determine how successful will the book be. If we ship out just a few hundred copies in the first 24 hours, the, this will be the number one child, new children's book on Amazon. And that is just absolutely massive. So the book is Think Like a Voter, davidpackman.com slash book. We do also make it available as an ebook, OK? But something about the paperback I think is fantastic. Check it out. Grab a copy. Let me know what you think. Leave a review. We've got a great bonus show for you today. Sign up at joinpackman.com. I'll see you then.